und ein herzliches Willkommen zurück auf meinem Kanal hier bei von der YouTube Let's Play als Hobby zu den Bonusvideos von Detroit Become Human. Es ist einfach mega interessant, was da für eine Arbeit dahinter steckte. Hintergrundwissen hier von Kara zum Beispiel. Einfach Wahnsinn. Also ich bin so begeistert davon. Wir haben jetzt noch eins, so drei, vier, fünf, sechs Videos zu gucken. Und da bin ich echt mega gespannt, was dann noch so alles dabei rauskommt. Das hat mir zum Schluss Detroit eine interaktive Geschichte. Und was sage, hunderte, zweihunderte Möglichkeiten, wie auch immer, alles einzeln nachgefilmt. <lacht> Jeden Text einzeln auswendig gelernt, damit sie es natürlich nachspielen konnten, die Schauspieler. Hammer geil. Was meinst du, wie verstrickt das ist, wenn man das Spiel dann zusammenbasteln muss? Du hast da hunderttausende von Dateien oder sowas und du musst die richtigen miteinander verknüpfen und auf alles Mögliche mittendrin noch dabei achten. Hammer. Wahnsinn. Okay, die Entstehung von Detroit, das gucken wir uns als nächstes an, wird direkt gekauft und ich würde sagen, let's go. Detroit Become Human was uh, produced over a period of four years. Here in Paris we have a team of about 180 people and to that we need to add also all the outsourcing with our partners in the Philippines, in China, Vietnam and in India. So when we started working on this story, I had to um, imagine where Kara was built. And um, for whatever reason, the city of Detroit came very quickly to my mind because it had already an incredible story by itself of uh, history and themes. So we traveled there with the team and we were really moved by what we saw. And we could really um, feel the desire to fight and, and really uh, be born again. And we just continued this curve, this growth, and just imagine what Detroit would be like if the Android industry was, um, you know, using these huge factories to build androids there. A very strong element in Detroit is that there's a lot of industrial wasteland and a lot of nature too. And for us, the graphic designers, it was an incredible playground. The destroyed zones which we wanted to preserve, we appropriated them to turn into something else. Then in the areas that needed to be rebuilt, we were able to imagine our Detroit of the future. We didn't want to make a science fiction universe, but a world of anticipation. If we chose science fiction, we could have imagined flying cars, extraterrestrials, but those things are very far from our current everyday life. Anticipation is more about gleaning from our contemporary reality, the one we know, because Detroit is set in 2038, and 2038 is tomorrow. The difficulty we had was sticking to reality. That is to say, technology becoming more and more invisible, a lot more elegant, and at the same time, making it visual. So all the computer equipment, autonomous cars, we simply had to invent. They are in fact very technological objects, but at the same time remain very credible and ingrained in reality. To create a cohesive universe in the fashion and clothing of the human characters in 2038, I didn't want to put an accent on strange shapes or really vibrant colors and things we wouldn't know. That I wanted to keep for the androids. The goal was to create something familiar which we can identify with in this future setting. Working on the artistic direction for the androids was a bit special because this is a project about the place they could occupy in the human world. It was out of the question for them to be too beautiful or too perfect. They had to correspond to every social class, rich and poor. Inspired by everyday utilitarian clothes, I brought a modern touch by adding dynamic display surfaces, the armband we can see on the side, the triangle on the front and back, an LED. Like that, there's no confusion. Wait. You're just an android? All right, ma'am. You need to go. You can't do that. You... Once we cast the actors, we travel to meet them in order to scan their faces. We record the structure of their face with the scan. And we record the colors and patches of skin with photography. Once we have this information, we will use this as a basis for modeling and creating the characters. The artist will make it more realistic, but will also enrich it. He will propose ideas which we will develop together. Finally, we will have a character with character who corresponds to the project in the world. When the actors come to Quantic Dream, we show them the design, what their image will be, and what they will look like in the game. This extra information gives them another dimension and color to connect with emotionally. 
It helps them think about how to play their character. Your mission. That's all you care about, huh? You should consult a professional who can help you. Beat it, you hear me? Get the hell out of here. So there are three types of shoots at Quantic Dream. Shooting and performance capture, where you capture the whole actor, his voice, his face, and his body. These shoots are obviously done with American actors because the game's original version is in American English. After that, there are the body-only shoots, representing around 250 days of filming, while the performance capture is 100 days of filming. Now, body-only shoots, there are two types. There are the action shoots and the technical shoots, which are mo-kit shoots. Mo-kit is when the player controls a character on the screen and he moves in an environment to explore it. This is of particular importance at Quantic Dream, and therefore we shoot a lot to offer a unique context for each scene and each character. To prepare a motion capture shoot, we first get together to look at the sets we need, the animations that we want to shoot, which ones need to be grouped together, or which ones need to be cut and shot at another time, so that we get the most out of the shooting day. This often means shooting scenes out of order, especially those with big props or accessories, like a big car, for example. So we shoot all the animations related to that particular prop first. The biggest challenge for the mocap team was shooting a Spider-Man mo-kit. We had to build a wall and attach an actor to a harness with cables so we could pull him up and render him climbing. The shooting on this game total took about, I would say, more than a year, maybe one and two years, with about 300 actors on, on set. So I would say it's quite a massive production. But so much happened on this set between the stunts and the shootings with a little girl and, and all the, these great actors that we had. It was really a, a very, very memorable journey for the team and for myself. Today, Detroit has over 37,000 animations. When we retrieve the motion capture data, it's just a cloud of points, which represent all the markers worn by the actors. From this cloud of points, we have a phase called retargeting, which gives us a skeleton. This skeleton will be applied to the characters of the game. There is still work to be done, but this gives us the main movements. Since we are working on something very realistic, we must recognize the actor and also recover all the emotion he expresses in his performance. We use a system of facts, an identity card for each actor. We make the actor do a whole range of facial expressions. Then we recover all the expressions and paste the animations on a puppet that Jan has prepared. I then recover and refine these poses. I might stretch the lip, reinflate a cheek, tiny details that make the finished product really capture the actor. Because of the nature of our mocap system today, when we receive the animations, we're missing eye movements. And so the character has that dead look. He really has no eyes, so then it's a big part of the work for the animators to find the regard of the actor in relation to his position, in relation to the body, etc. It was crazy when I saw the newest model for Kara, because they've been working on it and working on it, and this was the first time I literally jumped in my seat. It not only looked so much like me, it was the fact that it looked so lifelike. It wasn't that it looked just like it was a camera, it was something else, you know, but it looked alive. It's exciting, and it's kind of terrifying. <laughs> game after game, we learned the rules of, of optics and, and filming. And uh, our goal with Detroit Become Human was to have cameras that would actually emulate the optics of a real physical camera. So basically dealing with uh, real world imperfections was our main task, and uh, just to make cameras look as real as we can. Once the animations are shot and processed by the animation department, integrated and polished. We film them. That is to say, we really do a mise-en-scene, as in cinema. The real difficulty of our job is to know if these cameras are telling us something. Are they in the emotion of the scene? Do they describe exactly what the action must convey, what must be felt? 
The most important challenge for me was one of the final scenes where Marcus decides to start the revolution and go to the battlefield. Very quickly, we imagined this to be a huge sequence shot. We wanted the feeling of a cameraman running behind us while showing Marcus, the androids who help him, the person shooting at us, etc. Above all, it was necessary to say to oneself, this scene is very violent but does not glorify war. On the contrary, that war is something improbable and absurd. It was really a fun challenge. The idea was to say we have three characters. We would like each of them to have a specific cinematography. We wanted Kara to be much more filmed with some kind of handheld camera to have something very living, very breathing. For Connor, we wanted something very cold and very perfect. And for Marcus, we wanted something epic and spectacular. So it was about the, the filming, but it was also about the photography. So we worked with a, with a director of photography to give each character a different lighting, different key colors. Each of them would have their own worlds. And finally, we worked with the composers so they would create a specific sound for each character, so each would have his own world and his own style. Oh my God. <laughs> ich kann mich eigentlich jedes Mal nur wiederholen. Ich bin so begeistert davon, das ist Wahnsinn. Was da für eine Arbeit drin steckt, ich kann... Das ist... Am liebsten würde ich gerne mal selber bei sowas mitmachen, ja? Das ist so geil. Das ist, ich finde es geiler als ein Film. In der Hinsicht. Was, wie gesagt, Wahnsinn. Ich danke euch fürs Zuschauen. Vergesst keinen Daumen hoch und ein Abo, damit ihr natürlich Bescheid bekommt, wenn ihr das nächste Bonusvideo online kommt. Und ähm, falls ihr das Spiel noch nicht gesehen habt, dann ab auf meine Playlist und schaut euch das Spiel an. Hammer geil. Oder kauft es euch auf jeden Fall, um die Leute hier zu unterstützen. Und äh, spielt es selbst. Viel Spaß. Euer von euer YouTube. Let's play als Hobby. Bis zum nächsten Video. Bis dann. Tschüss.